Okay, so with that, how about we get started uh, for today? Um, I'm going to talk to you about pigments and colors and dyes, oh my. Some of the chemistry behind the uh, colors we see. Um, I've got some photographs I've taken and then photographs I've uh, rated from uh, various uh, places on the internet. Uh, on this particular slide, I've got uh, some uh, daisies and a rose of Sharon from my own backyard. Um, <clears throat> I was, uh, I had the flu last week, so I still got a bit of bronchitis this week. I apologize uh, for uh, coughing occasionally, um, but it's all for the best, believe me. Okay, so, humans like art. Um, we've been um, drawing graffiti in uh, various places for thousands and thousands of years. Here's a lovely example. This is a bison drawn in red ochre from the famous Altamira Caves in Spain. It dates to about, um, oh, close to 18,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, it's a, a done mostly in red ochre, which is a hematite or iron oxide, the regular old orange iron oxide rust. Uh, and this uh, image is public domain from uh, Wikipedia, um, hopefully public domain. So, we also have been um, doing pottery for a long time. One of the, one of the uh, distinct types of pottery from uh, ancient times are the um, black figure vases and the red figure vases. Uh, from uh, ancient Greece. And there's some wonderful chemistry associated with these uh, pots. The red is essentially the same red that made up the bison in the last slide, uh, iron oxide. The black is a slightly different iron oxide. It's an Fe3O4, which is the composition of magnetite. It's, uh, you know, in Fe2O3, you got a pair of iron three pluses. In Fe3O4, you have a pair of iron three pluses and an iron two. And the uh, amalgamation of all of those ends up changing the uh, color absorption profile. So it absorbs all the light instead of just the light that uh, allows you to see red color. And these pots are wonderful. They basically, uh, they basically show a very sophisticated knowledge of uh, firing, you know, basically taking the clay and baking it so that it uh, chemically changes into a, a different state. So essentially, um, you know, to make one of these, first you have to make a clay pot. And then you have paint. And we've got paint in quotes there. Uh, figures on it with a slip. A slip is a dilute clay. It's got a larger uh, particle size. It may be a different clay. It may have uh, different pigments in it. For the uh, black figure uh, vases, there's a lot of scratching of details into the uh, figures. And first what they do is they uh, fire the pot in an oxygen-rich atmosphere at 800 degrees. That makes the entire pot bright red. You can't see any of the figures on it. And then they raise the temperature and throw in green wood. This makes carbon monoxide. And the entire pot turns black with uh, the formation, the transformation of the rust iron uh, two oxide into this magnetite. And I say almost smelting here because uh, CO and carbon and low oxygen um, at uh, these sorts of temperatures are very reminiscent of modern smelting um, techniques, or at least the knowledge that goes into them. Finally, they let the uh, kiln that the, this stuff is done in cool back down. You uh, allow air in. And the thing about the 950 degrees Celsius is that the slip basically turns into a glass, and it protects the black color from interacting with air. Whereas everywhere else on the pot, uh, if it turned black, well, it reoxidizes to the red form. Okay, so this is very sophisticated uh, stuff. And here's a uh, this this particular um, objects in the British Museum. Another example. Uh, it's called the Siren Vase. It's also in the British Museum. 
it's a more advanced uh, technique, but it's still the same sort of three-stage firing uh, process. Notice how the figures here are uh, red and have a little more fine detail. Why am I showing you pottery when this is a chemistry talk? Well, so far, I think I've convinced you that um, the pot, pottery um, just developing the colors on uh, these does involve a lot of knowledge of materials. Um, in 2004, 2005, I used to have a um, class, chemistry and art, that um, I taught to our honors students. It was a great class. The unfortunate thing is that I lost most of my um, content for that class when I had a hard drive die on me. So this is an attempt to bring back a lot of the content that I used to have. So continuing, hey, um, let's let's get the question out of the way first. What is a pigment? What is a dye? Well, they're both colored compounds, and usually what people say is the difference is solubility. Does one dissolve? Does another dissolve? Okay. Pigments are the ones that are generally not soluble, at least in water. Um, dyes are generally soluble, but they need to be anchored to whatever is being dyed, the cloth or whatever, through the use of additives. And these are called mordants um, often. I'm not really going to talk about the dyeing process uh, in this particular talk. Um, there's so much um, content for uh, chemistry and art that um, I'm planning a series of talks in um, the next, over the coming months for this. So. Here's some photos. This is from the St. Louis Art Museum in 2003. They had a lovely um, they had a lovely display of pigments from the Renaissance. And so I've got a few pigments. I think my laser pointer is showing up. That's actual silver. That little one is actual copper. Uh, I've got matter. Cochineal, carmine, gum arabic, and indigo. We'll talk about indigo um, a little bit later in uh, the talk. <clears throat> so during the uh, uh, Renaissance, we had a variety of both organic dyes and pigments and inorganic dyes and pigments. The inorganic ones tend to be a bit more robust and might um, survive being put on pottery, for example, and firing up to 900 degrees Celsius. I don't think indigo would survive that. It would basically turn into carbon dioxide and water. Oh, I've got speed bumps. Here's some photos from my lab. This is cyclopentadienyl, this triphenylphosphine, ruthenium chloride. Look at the beautiful orange crystals. It really, you know, yeah, OK, it's a speed bump. So let's talk. And the speed bumps mark transitions in my talk. So one of the things that uh, if we're going to talk about color, we have to talk about light. So there's uh, light is just one form of electromagnetic radiation. And one way of quantifying the electromagnetic radiation is just to look at uh, the wavelength of the photons. And uh, photons can be emitted with wavelengths, uh, radio waves, there's like 10 to the third meters. That's like a kilometer long. I don't know if any radio stations actually use that sort of wavelength, but it exists. Microwaves are like centimeters long. Infrared are several microns long. Now, the visible light is about half a micron, half a micron or so. If we um, use nanometers as our um, measuring units. So a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So there are 10 to the 9 nanometers in a meter. Well, 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers is what's visible light. So this little region down in here where uh, you can see the familiar Roy G. Biv of the uh, visible uh, spectrum. So um, Shorter than that, we have ultraviolet, and there's a couple of different flavors of ultraviolet, UVA, UVB, UVC. Um, shorter than that, we have x-rays and gamma rays. And interestingly, all of these uh, frequencies can give you some chemical information. 
Okay, so CCG is telling me that radio waves in the AM band are 200 to 600 meters long. Awesome! Okay. So, okay, I uh, circled down here. The uh, I circled down here where the um, uh, visible region is, kind of in the middle of um, all of this uh, electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, if you could see in the UV, like bees do, flowers would look very much different. So essentially, uh, everything we see is just in this tiny little region over here. Um, 400 nanometers is the uh, violet end of the spectrum, 800 nanometers is the red end of uh, the spectrum, and many of the familiar uh, primary colors you're um, you know of are in the middle here. Okay? But that's not every color we actually can see. So one thing to remember about color is that your perception of color is constructed within your brain. Okay? So there's a little bit of physics involved. The eyes focus an image on a retina. Uh, so your retina is your detection device. Uh, just like the um, diode array device, uh, charge transfer device, I guess, in the um, cameras in your phone um, are, um, you know, what a lens focuses an image on. Um, you know, that part of the physics is pretty similar. There's cells in the retina that react to light. They actually have dyes. Uh, rhodopsin is one dye, and there's uh, various uh, variations on the theme of uh, rhodopsin. What rhodopsin does is it changes shape when light interacts with it, and eventually it changes uh, back. The shape change causes the specialized cells that send um, signals to nerve cells, but eventually um, photons falling on your retina um, cause nerve cells to fire. That transmits information to the brain and your visual centers uh, process the image to perception. So, you know, um, besides just the physics of the outside world, uh, your perception of color is individual to you and constructed within your brain. And I know there's a lot of philosophical debate about whether what I see as red means the same sort of thing that you see as red to you. Um, I usually sidestep that and say, well, well you know, we're kind of constructed the same, so hopefully my red and your red are similar. Uh, Unless, of course, uh, like my partner, you have red-green color blindness, and uh, then my red and my green might look uh, the same to you. And so, uh, color is constructed in your brain. Here's more of a view. Um, uh, notice in all of these slides, I've tried to be uh, good about um, making uh, attributions. If the text is too small to see easily, it's probably attribution text. You don't need to see it right now. Um, I'll make a PDF of this available um, when um, my chat is over. I forgot to do that uh, this week. So uh, light falls on, let's see, light actually um, um, falls on the retina, and the retina is constructed so that the light-sensitive um, cells are contained in these rods and cones, and uh, the light actually has to go uh, through a set of uh, nerve cells before it falls on the rods and cones, and then the nerves take the signals to the, um, to the optic, uh, main optic nerve. Um, that, that surprised me. I would have uh, thought it would have been um, easier to have the rods and cones on the outside. Yes, I agree with tagline here. So here's the thing with playing with your brain. So keep your microphone off. Um, this is a freshman chemistry, or I'm sorry, a freshman psychology experiment. Um, if you could look at these words and name the colors, do not read the words out. Okay, so the first one in the list is not red, it's green. 
there's a bit of a cognitive um, there's a bit of a, a, a cognitive uh, distortion that happens because the word red is screaming in your brain as you try to say green. Right? So when I say green, purple, blue, brown, yellow, uh, red, and, and blue, uh, that's about as fast as I can do it, even though I've practiced, because it's screaming in my brain, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, pink, brown. So the brain can be fooled. Perceptions of colors are uh, something that we can uh, play with. Um, yeah, it would be, help to be illiterate with uh, this one. I am. This is actually something I do for my freshman chemistry class when I'm trying to get them uh, comfortable with, um, with, you know, not maybe not knowing something or maybe not being able to find the right word. It's like, okay, everybody has um, brain fart moments. All righty, moving on. Moving on. Hey, the perception of color is constructed in your brain, but it has certain elements to it. Um, the uh, rods are sensitive uh, to light, but they don't give so much wavelength information. They uh, are very good for low level, uh, low levels of light, um, and they give you kind of black and white information. Um, there's three types of cone, and each is sensitive to a different wavelength profile, and that's what I've shown here. So uh, we've got the on the x-axis of this graph 400 to 800-ish, and the uh, different uh, profiles of the cones are shown. Um, there's one that's fairly sensitive to the blue end, and there's two that have a surprising amount of overlap. So I think you know, if you have uh, anything wrong with um, either one of those, then it becomes difficult to distinguish between um, the red and green end of the uh, spectrum. Okay, and um, while so, so I'm a chemist. There are several theories about how the brain assembles all of this information into the uh, perception of color. I think um, this would be a wonderful uh, talk for someone who actually knows what they're talking about. So, let's see, looking at the nearby chat, Syzygy, I guess that the rods and cones are at the back of the retina because those cells are sensitive to pressure, so it makes sense to protect them by not having... Yes, okay, cool. Um, my, uh, my understanding of physiology and how things are uh, put together in the body is, I mean, on, I, I can grind someone up and tell you what they're made of, but... You know how all the bits are put together. Um, that's that's beyond me. <laughs> so um, uh, attributions for the psychology section. I'm trying to be very good about making sure that uh, you know I uh, have no plagiarism here. I actually read the Creative Commons um, attribution licenses, and so authors and where it is and the actual uh, link that'll be in the uh, PDF. You can click on it when you get it. Here's another speed bump, some photos I've taken. Uh, the tree on the left is in my front yard. Uh, it's a maple tree. It turns this glorious red, orange, yellow, and green at times in the, um, the fall. Um, another orange speed bump, that's Seth, uh, where, where my little laser pointer. Uh, he's asleep next to me. Um, we made some um, Balefin. It's a... Uh, this is something from my lab. One of my students made this stuff. Uh, it's something stirring around in ethanol. We filtered it off. Beautiful orange color. Here's some more orange stuff. A lot of stuff I make in my lab is orange and red. Uh, and the, so, so I, I really like it when I get a blue sometime. So I'm going to talk about blue stuff uh, later in the talk. And again, the daisies. Um, Black-eyed Susans, I guess, is what we call them. Um, that's uh, from a backyard. So how do we get colors? Okay, so we can get colors from uh, both um, more physical techniques or more uh, chemical properties, physical properties of uh, molecules. I'll talk just a little bit about dispersion and interference. Um, I do want to note 
Uh, there's a lovely video of how soap films give you rainbow colors by Paul Doherty. Uh, Paul was a uh, giant here at Science Circle, and uh, we all miss him. Um, and uh, so I've I got two. Maybe I can hunt those down and put them in. Put them in. Yes. Got them. Okay, I'm hunting down the links and I'm going to copy them, put them in local chat so you can you can see them at your leisure. Um, moving on with uh, the first thing I was going to talk about, dispersion. Uh, these are related to refractions, butterfly wings, uh, and other um, feathers, and uh, many other. Um, um, biological uh, samples um, rely on uh, dispersion to give you uh, colors. Uh, colloidal solutions can give you uh, colors. So um, I was going to put the Pink Floyd album here, right? Dark Side of the Moon. Um, and if you're lucky, I won't uh, sing for, uh, any of it for you. Uh, but I was also worried about copyright infringement and stuff like that. We don't want our videos to be taken off of YouTube for uh, silly reasons like that. So, so here's one that's uh, reminiscent. It's basically uh, white light going through a prism, um, being split into the different colors. Uh, essentially, uh, um, the, um, each wavelength uh, reacts a little bit differently to, um, to going from air to glass uh, it slows down and they're uh, a little bit differently and the uh, angle that it gets um, deflected by uh, is slightly different so you know what comes out is the colors all spread together spread apart rather than together dispersion can do some wonderful things this is the Lysurgis cup. It's a, these are images from the uh, British Museum site. And in fact, I can copy those into local chat. So if you're interested, you can just grab the local chat later, enter. Uh, and the thing about the Lysurgis cup is that it looks different uh, depending on where you put the lamp. So by reflected light, it looks like a greenish cup. So uh, this cup was actually carved from a single block of uh, glass. And uh, it, it's got a couple of wonderful things about it. The colors are uh, wonderful. Uh, There's the craftsmanship in this carving, because you can see the snakes on the side are almost completely detached. You can see it clearly on the right-hand image. They're almost completely detached, but this was all carved from one single piece of glass. It wasn't, um, those snakes weren't attached later on. Uh, so, so that's a wonderful thing about this. Uh, it is worth a visit in real life. Uh, I'm hoping to get to the British Museum at some point. Uh, iron dissolved in, um, Glass would make greenish glass. That's I, what I, why I assume the reflected light looks greenish. The transmitted light looking red. Well, the light is dispersed by nanoparticles of silver and gold that are dispersed throughout this glass. Uh, I don't think that the Romans in the 4th century AD knew that they were making nanoparticles of silver and gold. However, uh, the manufacturing process of this particular glass uh, ended up giving us tiny, tiny particles uh, that uh, disperse light. And the least dispersed light, I think, is the uh, red. And that ends up coming through. So it ends up being uh, exactly the same uh, mechanism that results in uh, sunsets being red, uh, uh, very similar to uh, why the sky is usually blue, why the sky on Mars is red. Um, you know, basically, uh, sort of Rayleigh scattering, I guess that's all. Um, beautiful example, one of the prime examples that I use in, in my class. Let's see, where are we? Next slide. Okay, 
So uh, that was uh, dispersion. Dispersion can give us uh, colors. Uh, interference can give us colors. So this is uh, the soap bubble type thing. Uh, you know, essentially, if we look at my little diagram on the left, we can see a light beam coming into an object. And say the object is a transparent film of some thickness, some of the light can be reflected off of uh, the surface. Some can penetrate, go through, and then be reflected off the inner surface. Now, those two light beams have traveled different distances. They started off in phase. They started off with all the peaks of their photons and all the valleys of the photons uh, in, in phase, especially if it was a laser. Um, but after, um, after the reflections, one of these um, light beams has traveled a different distance. There's no um, guarantee that they'll be in phase anymore. So if it happens that the peaks and valleys still line up, you'll have what's called constructive interference, and you'll be able to see some light there. If they've traveled so that a peak of one light ray overlaps with the trough of another, then they will uh, essentially destroy each other. You won't be able to see. Okay, So we'll see a pattern of constructive interference and destructive interference, and it'll change, you know, as you move your head around. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this uh, diagram is on uh, is on Wiki Wikipedia actually. There's some really good stuff there. Uh, I I was not so keen on Wikipedia in the early days, but I think there's been enough scientists going through the various pages uh, to give very accurate stuff. Uh, at, at so yes, it's not the distance, it's also the refractive index. So the um, angle that, um, the various angles that the um, light gets refracted at or uh, comes out at, as well as uh, the different uh, distances plays a role in what you see. <clears throat> so butterflies take example, or take uh, advantage of, of, of this effect. Uh, Many of the colors that you see in butterflies are not dyes or pigments or anything that they've um, uh, kind of had to biochemically synthesize to give them a color. They can uh, use nanostructures. So take the butterfly and you keep looking at it under more and more expansion, um, more and more magnification until eventually you need a, a scanning electron microscope. At the highest magnification, you can see it's essentially a diffraction grating. This butterfly has grown uh, scales on its wings that have the properties of diffraction gratings that give it the colors that it chooses. Uh, and, you know, so, so this ends up, this ends up being a, um, this ends up being a mechanism by which um, we can see some really wonderful colors. Uh, and it doesn't really have a biochemical cost. And the, well, it does. I mean, they have to grow the wings. But to change their colors, all they have to do is change the uh, spacing and the diffraction grading, which is a lot easier to do than coming up with a biochemical pathway to synthesize a different um, coloring agent. Okay, so uh, the I, I you know from from what I see here, if I were to make a guess, I would say that it would be uh, fairly easy for generations of butterflies to be able to change their colors. And I think we've seen that in nature before, especially for moths. Hey, a speed bump. Um, here's some things I made in my lab. Um, my students have made these wonderful little crystals. Uh, this is a, let's see, what is it? If you take ethylene diamine and uh, salicyl aldehyde and boil them up in ethanol uh, and then let the solution cool, you get this um, lovely, um, it's called saline, 
we use it as a scaffolding for our ruthenium compounds. And here's some of the final compounds. When you shove the ruthenium in there, uh, they turn uh, dark blue and purple. Uh, in the middle, of course, there's uh, my cat. Um, uh, well, Sen, he, he passed away a few years ago, but um, it's a nice picture of him inside the planet glass set box. Okay, so dispersion and interference, uh, physical ways of getting color. A more chemical way, or at least um, a way that involves the um, physical properties of actual molecules is to look at things we call electronic transitions. Yay! Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to try and scare anyone with this stuff. Uh, we're going to start simple. So hydrogen. You've got two hydrogen atoms. They share electrons to make a molecule. Essentially, you've got a hydrogen nucleus, two electrons kind of hanging out, usually between the two nuclei and the other, other nuclei. And essentially, um, what, the, what electrons can do, where they can go in a molecule, uh, that's, that stuff's all quantized. Uh, when you get to very small objects, what uh, the, uh, most of their properties uh, end up um, being able to only take specific values. Okay? So for hydrogen, there's actually only two allowed spaces and energies that electrons can occupy. And um, you know, when two hydrogen atoms get together, they make a bond. We basically have a shape that I've outlined here on the right that looks kind of like an egg. It's a it it's um, has two foci in it. Those are the um, actual uh, nuclei. Most of the time, the electrons would hang out in between the nuclei and uh, cause the plus charges of the nuclei to be attracted to them to keep the whole thing together as a unit. We call this thing an orbital. And in fact, this is um, not meant to be offensive. It's the highest occupied molecular orbital. Chemistry is a hurtful subject sometimes. Um, the highest occupied molecular orbital is where um, the electrons are that um, um, have the highest energy in uh, the molecule. In this case, uh, there's only two orbitals. This other guy, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. The lowest unoccupied molecular orbital has this shape. Um, if electrons happen to be in this orbital, uh, the nuclei can kind of see each other a bit better. The electrons, if they're out on uh, either side, repel each other. This thing is destabilizing. If we think about um, where electrons can go, um, the probability of finding them as having wave properties, uh, constructive interference and destructive interference end up being something important in the construction of these uh, orbitals. OK, that's where the orbitals come from. But uh, why am I telling you this? Most of my students ask me that question at uh, some point during a lecture. An electronic transition is when an electron in one of these orbitals can absorb a photon, and um, it can basically go up in energy to the higher um, orbital. So essentially what happens is that you get um, the electrons arranged like uh, they are here, not in the same orbital anymore. Okay, this is a electronic transition. It's responsible for why things absorb energy. For hydrogen, that happens in UV light. You cannot see 111 nanometers. Um, so where do we go from now? Well, there's different molecules. Here's butadiene. Butadiene's got some orbitals. It's got lots of orbitals. It's got these things called p orbitals. Each carbon has one. And we can uh, put these atomic p orbitals together. They are simply sitting in the molecule side by side. And 
we can basically look at uh, four ways of putting them together. We can put them together with all the shading. This is phase information. All the shading um, happening on uh, top of the molecule, all the unshading happen on the bottom of the molecule. And it turns out uh, as you go up in energy, um, you get more of these um, nodal planes where the shading is on the top, then the shading ends up going to uh, the bottom. That's one nodal plane. This one, two nodal planes, and then finally three nodal planes. <laughs> if we count them, um, you're allowed two electrons per orbital. So you start off with four because each carbon has one. One, two, three, four. You've got uh, bonding happening up here. The word anti bonding is not meant to be scary, it's just meant to be hey, this is an. Um, uh, the shape of where electrons can go, but if you put electrons in, you get repulsive forces. This would be our highest occupied um, down here, our lowest unoccupied. The gap is only 258 nanometers now, right? Hydrogen was 111. This, oh, I'm sorry, this guy is, Oh, I forget where it is. I think it's about um, 220. Um, if you put another double bond, now you're at 258. The longer you make where the electrons can go, the, or, you know, the longer you make the series of double bonds, uh, the smaller that gap becomes. Or if you put a different type of atom in there. So notice how there's an oxygen in this uh, molecule taking the place of this CH2, essentially, if you're just looking at how the double bonds are going. Uh, the uh, oxygen has electrons, and they actually sit in the gap between what would otherwise be the HOMO and the LUMO. That makes the uh, gap a little bit smaller. This guy is 314 nanometers. That is still in the UV, but it's starting to get to the 400 zone where we can see. So a summary slide. There's different types of orbitals. Um, here's one type that's supposed to be one of the pi star anti-bonding orbitals. I made that model up in Second Life. The little thing there is actually a moon. Um, the different types of orbitals, there's bonding ones uh, where the um, bonding happens and the electrons are shared kind of head on between atoms. The pi is where you have sideways sharing of regions of electron density between atoms. N are when atoms are not actually sharing electrons, they just have a pair of electrons hanging out. Um, and then you have these weird anti-bondings, these empty levels where electrons can go after they've absorbed the photon. The beautiful thing about organic compounds, the two transitions on the left in the blue, n to pi star, pi to pi star. For just pure organic compounds, that's your colors. Because these uh, purple lines, the four on the right, n to sigma star, all the way over to sigma to sigma star, the energies of those are just way too high for you to be able to see those wavelengths. Yay! So as you make these molecules bigger and bigger with more double bonds, and look at the uh, look at the pattern here. You've got a double bond, single bond. My uh, pointer is acting up a bit. You got double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. And that pattern goes all the way to the other end of the molecule. Uh, essentially, that pattern, double bond, single bond, double bond, gives electrons some mobility and ends up increasing the wavelength. Beta carotene. Uh, is responsible for the orange color of carrots and uh, you know basically has uh, absorption in the visible. You have to have fairly large molecules with lots of 
going to use the sciency word conjugation, um, which essentially means double bond, then single bond, then double bond, to be able to see the um, to be able to see colors. So how do we study color? Um, show you a uh, UV vis spectrometer. This is a um, again from um, Wikimedia. Actually, this one's from uh, Libra Text. That they're actually very good too. You have a source, some lamp. There's a slit or a shutter that some light goes through. The light goes, the light beam goes through a sample, and then the light beam can hit some sort of grating, like the butterfly's wing. Um, a grating, a diffraction grating, can uh, take your um, colors and send them in different directions. And then the light, after it's hit the grating, all the different colors are separated, and then they can hit um, an array of detectors, like a diode array detector, or something that's very much like the um, the uh, light sensing element of the camera in your uh, cell phone. And then this information can be uh, sent to a computer. There's some very nice, uh, almost do-it-yourself spectrometers that are available these days uh, that uh, simply take advantage of um, diffraction gratings that you can um, get quite easily, 3D printing, and using your actual camera as uh, the detector. And they do a pretty nice job, actually, of um, of uh, um, uh, dispersing the color and uh, giving graphs. And so essentially what we can do is, here's uh, two graphs. We can look at which wavelengths get absorbed and which wavelengths get uh, transmitted. So the top is a nickel solution just dissolved in water. The bottom one is a nickel solution with uh, dissolved in water but with lots of ammonia around. And you can see similarities. There's um, three peaks. The peaks are where light is absorbed. So you don't actually see the uh, light um, at the wavelengths that is, uh, are associated with these peaks. What you see coming through the solution, what gives you the actual colors you see, um, are these troughs, right? Because the troughs are where uh, those specific wavelengths can just make it through the solution to your eye. Okay, so if you have a solution that absorbs blue light, then the green and red light are going to make it through the solution, and uh, then you'll see whatever mixture of green and red, whatever your brain does to that. Okay. Uh, interesting part here: going from water to ammonia ends up moving all of these transitions to slightly higher energy, and there's a reason for that, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So. Here's uh, some copper solutions. Uh, we have a lab where my students make, um, they start off with hexa aqua copper. That's copper with six water molecules attached. That's not hard to do. You just dissolve copper in water, and there you go. You've got your six water molecules attached. I haven't shown it because it's so pale that you don't actually see it. Um, the leftmost going to the right. We've added progressively more ammonia to the solutions. So um, we've uh, got a solution where essentially the major species has one ammonia on it. That's the leftmost. The rightmost, essentially there's uh, five ammonias attached if the students made up the solutions correctly. Uh, what's going on here? Well. Um, I'll show you in a second. Uh, hey, these are my cats. Uh, cats through the ages, 30 years worth of cats. Um, let's see. This is Ishtar. She's on the left. She's two years old. This is Seth. He's actually sitting in exactly the same spot right now, looking at me exactly the same way. Um, he's five years old. Um, the uh, other cats are uh, Tori, Sin, Bert, Manitoba, and... Um, Willow, and you know they've actually passed away. Um, Bert passed away in December. He was uh, 18 years old. 
So our cats tend to tend to last. We we tend to take good care of them, um, you know. But and they get old, they get cancer, things like that. So uh, we've got our two right now asleep and not threatening the keyboard in any way. I'll stop talking about them in case they do. Here's another speed bump. Um, some more photos. These are actually all from my backyard. We've got uh, dragonflies with uh, colors uh, from dispersion gratings. We've got um, tiger lilies of different sorts. There's a bee. I uh, have no idea why bees are colored the way they are, but they are. Um, that one is in a redbud tree. That's a <coughs> uh, tree that's local to uh, the uh, Midwest uh, region in Illinois. The buds actually come, they erupt out of the bark of the main trunk. It's kind of a cool thing, and that's the same dragonfly. So, now get back to why copper is uh, colored the way it is at the end of my talk here. But uh, I'll do some show and tell. This is my blue period. Um, all of these little round dots are supposed to be the RGB colors of these various uh, dyes. I'm sorry, all of these various pigments and indigo is a dye. So starting off, we've known about blue for a long time. Um, this is an example of a shabti. It's a small figurine that would be put in a um, put in a tomb, and um, evidently the small figurines uh, were supposed to come to life and do chores um, that uh, were necessary instead of having your uh, dead loved one uh, doing chores in uh, the afterlife. So this little guy would uh, go and harvest crops or something. Um, having um, Fetty the first harvest the crops. Um, Fence, that's uh, the type of um, ceramic that this is usually called. And this is an example of Egyptian blue. It's thought to be the first synthetic pigment. Uh, its um, formula would be calcium copper tetrasilicate. Uh, pretty much Pretty much um, sand is uh, silica, and um, the recipe apparently they used in later times bronze, which is a mixture of uh, copper and uh, tin, uh, to uh, get to make their Egyptian blue. Okay, interestingly, in uh, Roman times, the recipe kind of fell out of favor. Uh, and was lost for a long time. And in modern times, it has been rediscovered. Um, this is supposed to be the RGB, this little round dot, supposed to be the RGB look of the Egyptian blue. But um, I think from this particular object, it looks, it looks a little lighter. I've tried to make the uh, titles of these slides um, reflect which blue it is. Keep in mind that uh, what your monitor is made of may or may not be able to reproduce colors accurately. So there may be some colors that, when you see them in person, are subtly different from anything you can see on a monitor. You've probably seen this before, Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. There's two blues here. One of them is Prussian blue. And hey, Prussian blue is, Prussian blue has this structure as it, and I'm gonna bring down this model I've been using a few times. Well, maybe I'll just uh, bring it down there. Um, that's Prussian blue. Hopefully I haven't uh, crushed anyone under it. Um, it's, Iron cyanide. It's got iron three pluses. It's got iron two pluses. Let's see. All of the iron two pluses are attached to the carbon ends of the CN that makes the cyanide. All of the um, iron three pluses are attached to the nitrogen ends. Okay. And here the um, uh, nitrogen ends are these uh, gray areas um, on on this representation. 
Let me move that back out of the way. Up we go. Escape. Now I'll move my camera so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. So Prussian blue is one. Uh, cerulean blue is a cobalt stanate. So it's actually a cobalt two with a tin um, oxide um, anion. So it's cobalt two tin oxide. Uh, one's uh, the Prussian blue is a little darker than the cerulean blue. Uh, cobalt has a bad reputation for being toxic. It's well deserved. Uh, Prussian blue even. Though it's got all the cyanide in it, it's not particularly toxic. Okay, uh, and I've got some more um, pictures. There you go. There's the Prussian blue skeleton, and in fact, in the lower left and the lower right, I've uh, got a uh, um, more faithful representation. Inside each of the boxes, there should be a water molecule. Um, I've deleted that from the uh, Second Life version of it because it's it's not totally necessary to have it. Um, but, you know, essentially it's a very cubic looking um, structure. And you can see that um, the cyanides are uh, very strongly bound in the structure. Uh, they can't get out. So in fact, um, a Prussian blue itself is non-toxic and there have uh, been some research done with um, making um, magnetic nanoparticles of Prussian blue onto which you can graft uh, drugs and um, hopefully use magnetism to concentrate the um, drug after it's been given to somebody in a particular um, area in the body. I don't think those are gone to anything uh, clinical yet, but it was an idea that uh, was very popular for a while. Does the water molecule stabilize the lattice? Uh, I actually think it does. Uh, for a lot of these lattices, when you look at uh, different metals like chromium and uh, cobalt versions of these, you have to adjust charge. And uh, sometimes you have potassium ions that take the place of waters to stabilize uh, the charge. Um, otherwise, it's a big void. And as you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, if there isn't something in the void, uh, those may just uh, collapse. Another famous painting, here's a Renoir. Uh, he used cobalt blue, and that's a cobalt aluminate. And again, cobalt's kind of toxic. Uh, it's nicer to go with uh, things like Prussian blue. Um, one of the things I noticed when um, I was visiting my colleagues in uh, their art building, um, before they had a new art building with safety built in, um, was that they were doing many of the same things that my colleagues and I in chemistry were doing, except with, uh, let's say, less um, safety, um, safety going on. So yeah, yeah, that scared me. So I was, I, I'd be worried about just using really, really toxic chemicals um, as uh, pigments. Things that are much less toxic are much, are much nicer. Oh, here's one of the uh, cross-eyed stereograms of the cobalt blue crystal structure. Um, again, uh, when you look at the PDF of this, uh, you cross your eyes, try it now, and uh, see if you can get the images to overlap. Some people can do this, some people can't. Um, it's a fairly complicated structure. The pink is either cobalt or aluminum. They randomly substitute for each other. The um, red are oxygen atoms. The thing about how the oxygen atoms are arranged, each cobalt is attached to six in an octahedral fashion. Um, testing of artists for metal toxicity. I don't know if anyone's done it, but I'm I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that um, especially in the older days when uh, safety was uh, less seemed to be less of a concern, um, that uh, there are a lot of people who um, you know whose lives are shortened. Yeah, especially the, the yellow pigments would be like chromium-based a lot. 
lead-based, chromium-based, yes. So uh, everything I've talked about so far that's blue has been pretty inorganic. Here's a uh, indigo example. This is a um, kimono. It was made in Japan around uh, 1820. Um, you know, um, the, uh, this, this particular kimono is an um, example of some fabulous dyeing um, of silk in, um, in um, the um, 1820s. The, the in indigo has been used in uh, traditional um, cultures for uh, many, many hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Uh, let's see, I'm going to cut and paste some things soon, so I'll get that ready. Click. Okay. So, What's indigo? Well, it's, a, it's actually a naturally occurring organic dye. We make it artificially today because uh, it's in blue jeans. I mean, essentially, uh, we use so much indigo that um, growing it is uh, unfeasible. Um, OK. There, I'm going to cut and paste these links into nearby chat. There's some beautiful, uh, beautiful traditional uh, processing of indigo from a site in India that um, is on Google Arts and Culture. If you haven't played with Google Arts and Culture, I suggest that you do so. It, it, it's a great, great way of uh, spending an afternoon. But essentially what, um, essentially what um, these uh, photos show is um, indigo leaves of the plant indigo tinctoria, tinct, I'm sorry, indigo fora tinctoria, um, and uh, this comes from um, Uttarakhand, uh, India. And basically, the uh, leaves are put in a pot in the earth. They are allowed to ferment, and this allows the uh, indigo to come out of the leaves into the solution. The fermentation gives you a reducing environment, so uh, one in which electrons are available, gives you a basic environment. Under those conditions, the uh, indigo can uh, be dissolved in uh, its colorless form, even though it looks blue, there's a lot of the colorless form dissolved. And then you can soak cloth in there. Once you take the cloth out, I think the next photo here. Once you take the cloth out, then and just hang it to dry, then air can oxidize the indigo into a totally insoluble form that is color fast and stays in the fabric. Okay, so I've given you the structure of indigo here. Uh, there's a lot of this conjugation I measure, uh, mentioned early, the, earlier. The nitrogens have their own pairs of electrons. Um, the blue form is what is on the left in this diagram. Um, this is known as a redox dye. If you give this thing two more electrons, those electrons end up um, hanging out on the oxygen. This disrupts the conjugation a little bit and just changes the properties of the molecule so that it's no longer blue. The charge allows it to dissolve in water. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, the pH is right, otherwise if uh, hydrogen's attached to those oxygens, it'll be colorless, but also not soluble. And the little equation at the bottom shows what happens with oxygen. Essentially, um, you get back to the blue form. So, hmm, yeah, fermentation is wonderful. We, we're actually getting, um, getting a um, um, bioprocessing specialization in our chemistry uh, program happening soon. At least I hope. We've got the paperwork and it's going through the system. Um, it'll basically um, a whole set of fermentation uh, classes and quality control of fermentation classes that are going through now. Uh, how does the UV uh, light affect the dye chemically? This particular one, um, this particular one is more stable to UV. Um, there are orange dyes called azo dyes that have two nitrogen atoms attached to each other. 
Uh, and essentially what can happen there is that nitrogen-nitrogen bond can end up getting cleaved. And when that happens, your molecule falls apart and your orange color uh, goes away. Azo dyes, uh, reds, oranges, uh, this is kind of why many of the orange dyes in the mid 20th century were not so color fast. Wonder how uh, this was discovered. Um, you know, in uh, the UK in hundreds of years ago, the plant that's called Woad, W-O-A-D, also has indigo in it. So I actually think that um, I actually think that it's fairly obvious when uh, rotting leaves of these uh, plants, um, you know, are, are around. I think that you actually do see the blue color, and that would have attracted um, some attention because blue is very hard to get. So here's our newest blue, the Yin Min blue, discovered 2008-2009 uh, by Maz Subramian at Oregon State University as part of an NSF-sponsored research. Um, they were looking for um, um, materials with high reflectivity in the near-infrared region. That's actually a little longer than the uh, visible region, 200, I'm sorry, uh, 900 to 2,000 uh, nanometers. Um, this color has been uh, commercialized. It's close to cobalt blue. It's going to be a lot less toxic, I think. It says non-toxic, but I'm going to treat that with a with a grain of salt. I don't know what yttrium, um, um, indigo, and manganese would do to you. I think I tried getting some examples, but um, here's. Um, the, the examples seem to be uh, copyrighted. So um, in lieu of examples, here's a crystal structure. Um, I believe I believe the uh, yttrium atoms form layers separated from layers of manganese by the red oxygen atoms. So this is a nice layered uh, type structure. And again, this is a cross-eyed um, 3D sort of model. Click. And um, inorganic pigments for stained glass. Um, this this is at the end of my talk here. I think uh, rather than um, going on for another five hours about um, um, orbital structure for d orbitals and the like, um, basically, um, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up in the next few minutes. Uh, this is actually a uh, stained glass piece that's in uh, the church in my hometown, that's Cowansville, Quebec in Canada, and it's a memorial to a World War I uh, soldier. Stained glass is a whole topic um, that uh, really interests me, and uh, I think I'll probably do a, try and do a whole talk on it in the future so I can learn more about it. Um, yellow colors and gray colors um, end up um, um, being well suited for using things like silver sulfide. Um, you apply a paste of silver sulfide to glass, you heat the glass up, some of the silver and sulfide ions would penetrate into the glass. Um, depending on uh, what else is in the glass, you might get a yellow um, color or uh, shades of gray. So finally, I'm going to actually uh, just talk about orbs just a tiny, tiny bit. Where do the inorganic colors come from? Well, they come from uh, transitions in d orbitals, right? So d orbitals are these four-leaf clover-looking things, and uh, this is a um, this is a view of one of the um, uh, landscapes I made in Unity. Um, why would d orbitals do this? I've got a little animation I've made. In Second Life, I'll bring it. I'll bring it forward. Um, essentially, if you got six things attached to a d orbital, or I'm sorry, six things attached to a metal, and they're in an octahedral um, arrangement, what does that mean? Um, you got a metal. Say it's in at the origin of a um, x y z Cartesian coordinate system. Um, so the uh, the, there would be a, if it's octahedral, you'd have uh, something on top, on bottom, to the left, to the right, in front, and in back. 
So essentially, if you look at the left mo I'm sorry, the rightmost little um, orbital I've got here, there's a box around it. And the little wooden spheres on the box um, correspond to um, places where an atom could be if there were if it were in the octahedral coordination environment. There's two types of d orbitals if you're considering left, right, top, bottom, front, back. There's the d orbitals that point directly at those sites, and then there's the d orbitals that point in between the sites. If you point at the sites, electrons in those d orbitals are going to be raised in energy because they'll experience more repulsion. So this box is going to grab any d orbital that has um, that uh, points directly at those left, right, uh, front, back, top, bottom um, objects, um, and then um, is going to uh, raise it in energy. So let's see if it actually does so. Oh, yes. So two of them go up, and then the rest are left alone. And this just loops over and over again. Okay. So essentially, we get two sets of um, orbitals, one at lower energy, one at higher energy. And um, the blue colors, the nice um, colors we see for transition metal uh, compounds, uh, arise from uh, different energies, or I'm sorry, from uh, the promotion of uh, electrons from the lower set to the upper set. Okay, so I had a question here. Um, Red dye contributing to ADHD. I don't know. Um, I kind of doubt it, but then I have no idea. Um, and then um, not sure which blue was used in the Federal Union uh, uniform. Um, so uh, sorry for not getting to that uh, just, just a little earlier. So I think that's a good place to stop for now. Um, I'm going to continue this kind of chemistry and art sort of uh, talk for uh, probably a few talks in the future. So right now, I'll throw it open to questions. Um, I see some uh, are violet and blue dyes more sensitive to oxidation. Um, it depends. Uh, the blue, the like the blue pigments I showed you that are inorganic, they're pretty robust. Uh, like the Egyptian blue is something that is um, that can survive being in a fire. Um, organic dyes, they tend to be uh, more subject to uh, oxidation. So, so yes, I'd say the organic ones are. Modern dyes, the ones that have been developed most um, recently, would be, you know, one of the things we've looked for are um, oxidation stability. So if something was developed kind of in the early 20th century, it's probably going to be sensitive. Um, if it's developed like last year, then it's probably going to be less sensitive. One wonders how artificial dyes might affect epigenetic markers and genetic expression. Um, yeah, the dyes are the dyes are organic compounds and we know that uh, there's lots of organic compounds um, in our modern um, in our modern conveniences. I mean, when you look at the plasticizers in uh, plastics, um, a lot of them, like uh, BPA, uh, uh, apparently have um, hormonal activity or mimic hormone activity. Um, so, yeah. There's uh, there, there's there's a possibility that um, epigenetic markers can be affected. I'd say with the azo dyes and things that are um, a little more sensitive and might give you more radicals and the like uh, when they react with um, light, uh, that you could even get uh, genetic damage. See, my mother used to keep some dark blue black paper. In with some antique fabrics to protect them from oxidation. Yes, um, I have that stuff too. Um, what is it? I and 
I don't even know what that stuff is, but uh, it's. I think it's essentially uh, got some um, metal particles in it that absorb um, sulfur, because uh, um, it's um, not so much. You couldn't really have so much that it would affect uh, oxidation from air, but oxidation by sulfur leads to tarnishing. So, in fact, I have some of that stuff in with my silver. Let's see, does the mordant use to set the dye influence the color? Yes, it does. Uh, so, essentially, essentially, you can have an organic molecule that's soluble, and um, it, um, is, um, it, it gets like permanently attached to maybe a transition metal ion, or more commonly, an aluminum 3 plus ion that's sitting um, attached to a fabric. And when the organic molecule wraps itself around the metal, there are changes in the energies of the orbitals, and that does change the color. Um, and how does the mordant affect the life and deterioration of the pigment? Well, it varies. Uh, if the mordant is anchored really well to the fabric, uh, then the uh, pigment will be uh, set really well. But the um, pigment, the um, organic part of it, has to remain attached to the metal. Uh, you know, factors that influence whether it's attached are, you know, when you wash this fabric, uh, what sort of pH does your water have? Or is H plus competing with the um, with the dye that's attached to the transition metal or aluminum ion that's um, anchored to the fabric? Um, so yeah, I mean basically, basically um, what we've tried to develop is um, dyes and mordants that um, stay in a fabric like forever. But it's there's always fading. Oh, uh, pigments in paint. Since you don't wash paintings so much, uh, or at least I hope no one's taking uh, like a power sprayer uh, to their local art gallery, um, the those issues are a little less uh, intense. Um, so pigments in paints for uh, paintings, um, usually you have to worry about oxidation from air and um, exposure to UV light. Um, the inorganic, the inorganic uh, pigments are usually very stable. Um, sometimes when you mix two pigments together, uh, and you might have some electron transfer happening, one is an oxidant and one is a reductant, that may mean that there are some pigments that are incompatible with each other, or they might make some uh, fabulous new shade that, uh, that can't get any other way. Um, you know, but uh, also worrying about organic pigments with oxidation and UV, that can, you know, if you make the molecules and break them up into smaller chunks, they're not so conjugated and you don't see their colors anymore. One should not restore paintings with cats around. Oh my god, yeah, oh yeah. Um, I try to keep anything of value like in my office at work because I know my cats. Uh, if there's anything of value that they can destroy, they will destroy it. I think that's a corollary to Murphy's Law. I think Murphy had cats. Let's see, did I, did I miss any uh, questions? I like the fermentation uh, reference, because uh, those are, that's, uh, that's a very uh, cool area of chemistry these days. Yeah, I think I got everyone's questions. Okay, well, bye, Suzuki. Excellent. Well, with that, I think I'll um, call it quits then. Um, I am going to continue, um, you know, using um, the art as art world as a um, inspiration for uh, some of these chemistry talks that I give from now on. Yay. Thank you, Chantal. Excellent. Well, uh, very pleased to be here. Thank you all for your time and attention. Um, I should probably also 
zoom through some slides, blah, blah, blah. Here's what I haven't shown you, but I should get to the acknowledgement slide somewhere where we have NSF thanked. Yes, somewhere NSF has been thanked. Wow, okay. Well, I would still like to thank NSF for their support and all of my um, all of my uh, colleagues and uh, SIUE for its support as well. Thank you all for um, thank you all for um, coming. I'm going to sign off soon. Okay, going radio silence.